please open in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. And if you'll stand, I'll be reading verses 43 through 48. It is a, a joy to be back in the pulpit this morning, but I, I must say that I had a, it was just a, a delight to, to hear all of the good preaching last weekend for the solo conference to just come and be blessed by that. I want to thank everyone who was involved in that, but I particularly want to thank Ron, who put so much work into that. So when you see him, make sure you thank him for that. Uh, and so I just had the precious privilege of coming, and, and I got to chauffeur Phil Johnson, a friend of mine, around and eat dinner and, and do all kinds of fun things and hear the Word of God. It is a refreshment to my own soul, uh, and I know you guys know this, but uh, to, to hear the word well preached, and oftentimes I, I perhaps don't get as much of that as I should. And so that just last weekend, just to be immersed, I mean, what better way to spend a weekend when we had Friday night and Saturday and Sunday just to be poured into? Uh, if you didn't, if you weren't, weren't able to be there, I just would urge you to get those messages, every one of them powerful and impactful because they were brought from the word of God. So again, thanks for all, and, and I just am myself spiritually refreshed from that weekend. Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 43. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Please be seated. For God so loved the world, yes, you can quote it with me, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. John 3, 16. Now, you know the verse, most of you. The question this morning is, do you believe the verse? Do you believe that God is love? Do you understand what it means that God is love? And perhaps most importantly, do you love like he loves? Because that's the point of our message this morning. Really, Jesus, is fin Jesus finishes out the discussion on having a righteousness that is greater than that of the scribes and Pharisees, by ending with the most fundamental aspect of righteousness, and that is love. You know what the scripture says, that if you love me, Jesus said, you will obey my commandments, but we must understand that love and obedience are not the same. Love motivates obedience. Obedience then drives greater love as we see God do his work. But the question this morning is, do we love? And unfortunately, I think perhaps in the circles in which, reform circles perhaps, and many from where many of you come, there has been maybe a, a lesser emphasis on the love of God because of how much that has been misrepresented in the presentation of the gospel in the last 40 or 50 years. And so it has become a very unfortunate fact that sometimes we can even have gospel presentations where the love of God isn't even mentioned, as though it were something to shy away from or be afraid of because it has been misrepresented by some. And we, can't, we cannot present the gospel. We cannot present the kingdom. We cannot live within the kingdom unless we understand what love is. The world desperately needs to know that God is love. And as such, his love flows through every part of his nature and to every one of his creatures. God's love is perfect, holy, just. It is compassionate and gracious so that it is extended in proper measure and perfect timing in every situation. Our love, by contrast, tends to be conditional, petty, selfish, and most certainly limited. But as kingdom citizens, we have the precious privilege of being loved by the king and being empowered by that king to love others with his unquenchable love. This is the primary way in which the world will know the greatness of the kingdom and will be drawn to come underneath our great and mighty king. You see, we don't need gimmicks. We don't need entertainment. We don't need cultural conformity to demonstrate the greatness of God's kingdom. We need the love of the king. And that love must be expressed to one another and out towards a dying world. And in fact, all of those other things, the gimmicks, the entertainments, the, all the things that the church is seeking to do in our age are really a mask for the fact that we do not love. And when we do not love, it doesn't matter what we do. It doesn't matter what kind of show or production we put on, it is ineffective. 
And that, unfortunately, is what is happening to the church today. Because there is not genuine love, because we have lost the understanding of what it means that God is love and that we are to love in such a way as he has loved us, therefore we have to add all of these other things to somehow draw people to the kingdom. Imagine! Imagine having to kind of cajole people to come into the kingdom when if we would pour out love for them by the Lord's grace and as he is working, they will be drawn to us like a moth to a flame. That's the nature of the kingdom, and that is what Jesus proclaims as he finishes out this part of the Sermon on the Mount, discussing what it is to love, why it is that we love, and what that love looks like. So what we'll see this morning is that only when kingdom citizens begin to understand, appreciate, and partake of the love of the king will they be able to extend that love in a powerful way that draws people into the kingdom. Only when the kingdom citizen begins to understand, appreciate, and partake of the love of the king Will they be able to extend that love in a powerful way that draws people into the kingdom? Now, it's important because we are working verse by verse that I again remind you of where we stand in our text. Many months ago, we began the Sermon on the Mount, and we began it with Jesus really laying out the qualifications for what it means to be in the kingdom. Those who are poor in spirit, those who mourn, those who are gentle, and so on, the Beatitudes. That's the hard attitude of everyone who is in the kingdom, and essentially it's what's necessary to be in the kingdom, and it is what the Spirit of God produces through the Word of God when He regenerates the heart, and there's response and repentance and faith. Then, in verse 13 of Matthew chapter 5, He began to transition into discussing how it is that that kingdom impacts the world. That's the nature of kingdom citizens, but what are they to do in the world? Well, they are to be salt and light, salt to a world that doesn't taste Christ. Light to a world that doesn't see Christ properly, and we are to reflect that to them. And then in verse 20, he began to lay out how it is that the kingdom citizens will actually accomplish that, and it certainly will not be with a self-righteousness, with a righteousness that is drawn from our own internal reservoir, as it were, of our human effort. It will only come from a righteousness that surpasses, he says in verse 20, that of the scribes and Pharisees, because their righteousness was self-generated. It was a self righteous, righteousness, and therefore no true righteousness at all. And so he lays out a series of contrasts. That is, he, he picks up things that the scribes and Pharisees were teaching, really perversions of Old Testament teaching, and he brings, Jesus brings his own explanation and fulfillment to those. That is, teaching what truly the Old Testament taught and then what is fleshed out in the New Testament and what he himself fulfills and empowers. And he began by saying, murder equals anger, and so we have to reconcile and forgive, not just not kill people physically. He says adultery equals lust, so we have to radically amputate lust within the heart, not just stop committing adultery externally. He said divorce equals adultery, and so we need to remain faithful to our first wives, not simply writing certificates of divorce to get ourselves off the hook. He says that vows are actually promises to and before a holy God, so we are to let our yes be yes and our no be no. And the fifth illustration that we have spent multiple weeks looking at is is the exhortation, the Old Testament principle of an eye for an eye. It means we, we may not hold grudges, we may not take our own revenge, and so we are to overcome evil with good. But now, I think by no accident, he comes really to the crux of the matter in verse 43. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies. And so the sixth and final challenge that Jesus brings comes against the shallow, worldly righteousness of the religious leaders, which caused them to pervert even the concept of love. Of course, that is why it is so important that we understand it, because it is not as though love, just the word proclaimed, somehow is, has some kind of magical or mystical impact in and of itself. Just love! If we don't understand what that means, then we are not able to love. Either we will love self-righteously and selfishly, or we will love in, in order to somehow gain approval before a holy God instead of loving as he loves, loving in response to the love that he has given. So first let's look at the Pharisees' perversion of this law of love. What was being preached at the time, Jesus will then bring proper correction to. So the Pharisees' perversion starts off seeming pretty good as it did in several of the other illustrations that Jesus uses. He says, you have heard that it was said, and that, again, remember, that means this is the common teaching in Israel now. This is what your religious leaders are teaching you, drawn from the Old Testament, and there's a tradition of this. It's not just the latest teaching, not the latest rage. Apparently, this has been being taught for quite some time. It is in the spiritual culture. You have heard that it was said. And by the way, there's many things like that today. Go to the internet, go to things that you've heard you know, 20 or 30 times. You, you know, hear people say certain phrases that may or may not even be correct, but we just have been taught them over and over, so we say them. That's essentially what's going on here. 
He says, you've heard that it was said. This is what the religious leaders are saying. And again, it starts off pretty well. Love your neighbor. Like, yeah, I mean, sure. We understand that. Now, he's going to give a second phrase here. But first, let's just look at that for a moment. Right? You shall love. The word is agape or agapao, which is, the, which is a godly love, the love that is generated by the Spirit of God in the heart of the believer. Now, he's going to use it with several different nuances throughout our text. And certainly when he's speaking of unbelievers, they don't have that godly generated love. They have an echo of it, as we will see. Nonetheless, he is speaking of this godly love. That is how Jesus is addressing this. He's not using some of the other words for love that he might use. He is using a godly love that is generated by the Spirit of God in the heart of the believer. He says, you are saying, you shall love your neighbor. And really, neighbor, very basic word. Someone who lives close by, you know what neighbors are. Now, you never see them in our day and age. All you see is the garage door closing. <laughs> That's about all we see. But nonetheless, all right, it's the people that are around you. And probably more specifically, it's anyone you come in contact with. And maybe even, even more, to broaden this a bit, I think, in our understanding, it's anyone you are aware of. Because essentially, neighbors can live across the world if you're aware of them and praying for them. So it's anyone that really comes into your range of consciousness. I mean, it's, it's very broad as Jesus describes it later on. Now, we're going to see that the Pharisees weren't using it that way. But biblically speaking, that's what it is. It's anyone that is in your sphere of influence that you are aware of or that you bring before your mind or comes into your path. You shall love your neighbor. Now, this is a quote from Leviticus 19.18. You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the sons of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Again, it's very interesting. It's like Jesus is working through the Old Testament, taking each of their teachings. What, was this? what have we been just discussing the past weeks? The idea that you can't bear a grudge, that you can't take vengeance. Well, now Jesus is moving underneath that to address the reason that they could even misrepresent eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. It's because they didn't love and they didn't understand what it meant. And so they perverted it into really a selfish pursuit. Selfish love. It's an oxymoron, isn't it? And that's what we will see that the Pharisees did. But uh, again, they're taking it from the Old Testament. You shall love your neighbor. Now, interestingly enough, when Jesus quotes what they were saying, essentially, again, he's quoting what the Pharisees were teaching, he, he leaves out as yourself. Notice that. Jesus, he says, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor. Now, the quote from Leviticus 19 says, love your neighbor as yourself. It's hard to know whether Jesus was simply just representing that common teaching and that leaving out as yourself isn't really important. But it may be that he indicates or that the, the dropping of this phrase by the religious leaders is purposeful. That is, that they wouldn't even allow love to be elevated to the point of that you should love someone else as much as you care for yourself. That's possible. Because it certainly is true that the religious leaders did not love others as themselves. They didn't even reach that. In fact, they loved themselves far more than they loved anyone else. And so it would seem merely that even in their expressions of love, it was kind of a condescending love. We're great, you're little, and we might give you some leftovers. We might throw you some scraps. Now, the closer you are to us, as we will see, you might get a little bit more love, but love you as I love me, or in the way I care for myself, in the way I view myself. Now, whether or not they were proclaiming that, I think that perhaps in the dropping of the phrase, as yourself, Jesus is at least implying that. Love your neighbor, great, but not even to the extent that you would love you. And isn't that true for us? Yeah, we'll give a little bit of love here or there, but it's not nearly the love we give to ourselves. We care for ourselves. We, we know what we want. We know what we desire. We pursue those things with reckless abandon. So... The, even the quote here is not up to fully what the Bible even said. It's a misquote that the Pharisees had that Jesus is quoting them in. So, you shall love your neighbor. Now, it is, it, it's important for us to understand that the scribes and Pharisees, were, we don't know exactly how they were teaching this, but we do know that at least some of them, and really in, in general, it was understood that love undergirded the law. That's not simply a New Testament concept. The idea that it is love which generates obedience is certainly, it was preached in the Old Testament, it's written there, and it was understood by many of the teachers of the day. We know this from passages like Mark chapter 12, verse 31, where there is a scribe who confronts Jesus, really trying to trip him up, and says, what, what's the greatest commandment? You remember how Jesus answers that. He says, the first commandment is, or the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is this, Mark 12, 31, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The two went hand in hand. There is no other commandment greater than these. 
right? And actually, this is, this is, so this is Jesus responding to the scribe, and the scribe says to him, right, teacher, you have truly stated that he is one, and there is no one else besides him, and to love him with all your heart, and with all understanding, and with all strength, and to love one's neighbor as himself is much more than burnt offerings and sacrifices. So you see that there was an understanding of this, that, that love undergirds the reality of the law, but the Pharisees, even, even with that, had perverted this teaching, as we will see, to a very narrow bandwidth of people that you would even extend any love to at all. And in fact, they had they'd added a piece to it that the, that the law did not specifically state, which we'll look at in a minute, that is it, it is okay, or really that you should then, as kind of a corollary to loving your neighbor, that you are to hate your enemy. And... If you look through the, old, through the New Testament, you will see that everywhere love is presented as that which undergirds obedience, as that which enables obedience to the commands of God. Romans 13, 8. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there's any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Notice that the second of the great commandments really sums up the first. You cannot love your neighbor if you do not love God. Again, with the true scriptural understanding of that word love. Love, Paul goes on to say in verse 10 of Romans 13, does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. And Galatians 5.13, for you were called to freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then James uses a very interesting phraseology for this idea of, of loving your neighbor. He says, if however... You are fulfilling the royal law. According to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. So certainly this is fleshed out in the New Testament, understood by many, even understood by those who weren't directly coming underneath Jesus' teaching very often. So how did they pervert this? What were they actually doing that kept them from living out the ramifications of the things many, that many of them actually understood? Well, it seems that the second phrase kind of illuminates for us how they were misunderstanding love your neighbor because, really, so when it says love your neighbor, that's imperative. You must love your neighbor. Fascinatingly enough, as we move to the second statement in verse 43, and hate your enemy, the hate here is also imperative. That is its command. You must love your neighbor and you must hate your enemy. It's not just like kind of in contrast, you know, you love your neighbor and so anyone who's not your neighbor you don't like as much. No, this is, this is hate your neighbor. You must express a hatred towards them. All right? A dislike for, all right? to put in disfavor or disregard. And your enemy simply is one who hates you, one is hostile to you, one who desires your injury. Now, how could they get away with this? Or certainly, again, they'd read the Bible and the people they're speaking to would understand what the Old Testament said or at least would have knowledge of it. So how could they preach this and still have people think they were holy? Well, I think there's three pieces to it, and you just kind of have to write them in wherever you can. There's not a, an outline spot for them. But the Pharisees could teach this, I think, for three reasons. One is because I do think they generally perverted the Old Testament understanding of love. Because the Old Testament does speak to the fact that you are to love your enemy. That's not going to be brand new teaching when Jesus, when Jesus states it. Job 31, remember Job was written in the time of the patriarchs before the Mosaic Law. Right, in the time of Abraham, most likely, Job says this, Have I rejoiced at the extinction of my enemy, or exalted when evil befell him? No. I have not allowed my mouth to sin by asking for his life and a curse. Job understood you're not supposed to hate your enemy. You're not supposed to rejoice when your enemy falls. Right? So Job understands this. How about Psalm 35? This is David speaking. He's speaking of his enemies, those who have harmed him and are persecuting him. And he says, They, that is his enemies, repay me evil for good to the bereavement of my soul. But as for me, when they are sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled my soul with fasting and my prayer kept returning to my bosom. Very interesting as we look at our passage of what it means to love an enemy. David is doing that. He is praying for his enemies in the Old Testament. So certainly again, this was understood. That even those who hated him when they were sick, he was praying for them and he was, he was crying out. He was humbling his own soul towards them. He continues on in verse 14, I bowed down in mourning as one who sorrows for a mother, but at my stumbling they rejoiced and gathered themselves together. The smiters whom I did not know gathered together against me. They slandered me without ceasing. So I think the Pharisees were conveniently overlooking certain portions of the Old Testament they didn't like. I do think that's clear because the Jews were known 
and particularly during the time of Jesus, and, and certainly even before then, for hating other races, for being condescending and arrogant and despising of anyone who wasn't a Jew. They had really raised this to a national pastime. Right? So that's what was going on. Somehow the Pharisees, overlooking clear teaching of the Old Testament, had drawn out that idea. And, and the reason is, then, for these, the two other uh, pieces of this puzzle as to how they could say, hate your enemy, I think they also had perverted the view of what a neighbor is. That they had managed to narrow that to such a small portion of people that they were able to hate most people and love just a few. And I think this is drawn out in Luke chapter 10. Go ahead and turn there so you see it with me. Luke chapter 10. Again, another discussion on the nature of, of obedience and what are the greatest commandments. In Luke chapter 10, verse uh, 26, or verse 25, a lawyer stood up and put him to the test. Always they were coming after Jesus, trying to get him to, to go against the Old Testament or go against uh, what God had said. Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? As though this man wanted to know. But anyway, that's, a, that's another discussion. Verse 26, and he said to him, what is written in the law? How does it read to you? So Jesus just fires back, all right, you're a lawyer. What's in the law? Why are you asking me? You're the one that specializes. Remember, a lawyer back then was not someone who you know, took people to court for traffic violations. A lawyer was someone who knew the law of God, or supposedly knew it. And he, said, or, and he answered, the lawyer said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. You see that they understood that love was the basis of the law. However, all right, Jesus says, and he said to him, you've answered correctly, do this and you will live. Fascinating verse 29. Look, listen to what the lawyer says but wishing to justify himself. And the answer is to whom? Hadn't Jesus just said, you're doing well? Yeah, but it's that last phrase, do this and you will live. I think the implication is, yeah, you know the truth, but you're not doing it. Because instantly this lawyer comes back and says, to justify himself, he said to Jesus, um, who is my neighbor? Because they instantly jumping into the mind of the lawyer were all the people that he didn't care for, that, that he didn't love, that he wasn't giving himself for, and he wanted to make sure he got that out of the way, he could justify that. Now, that was the wrong thing to say. Jesus lays out then who his neighbor really is, and that essentially, again, is anyone who is in need. And then he goes further to say, and you essentially religious leaders are ignoring your neighbors, hating them and despising them, the ones in need, while someone like a Samaritan, whom you despise, is actually the one who loves his neighbor. So you're not justified at all. Nice try. Wishing to justify himself. And that's what the Pharisees were doing in this teaching. Love your neighbor, sure. But your neighbor is only essentially a Jew, and then, even, even stronger than that, your neighbor is a Jew who is living according to Pharisaical teaching. The closer you were to the Pharisees, the more you looked like them, the better Jew you were, the more love that you received. But everyone else was hated. And, that's kind of the third piece to this puzzle, they would have said, I believe, and, and essentially have, have implied, that the reason that they hated everyone else is because God did. God hated everyone who wasn't a Jew. God hated everyone who wasn't in a, in a certain capacity according to his law. That was their teaching. That isn't the truth. But it was drawn from a perversion, of, of, a perverted view of God's hatred of sin. Because there certainly are, are verses in the Old Testament, places in the Old Testament where it speaks of God hating sin. And of hating sinners. And of bringing his judgment upon them. So it seems like they were perverting that to then teach, look, you love your neighbor who is a Jew, Living, that is living according to the way we interpret the law, and everyone else you can hate because God hates them too. Gentiles, tax collectors, anyone who isn't us. For example, ex, uh, Exodus 17, 14. The Lord said to Moses, write this in a book as a memorial, recite it to Joshua, I will surely blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven, a nation that had come against Israel. See, I'm gonna, I'm gonna wipe them all out, eternally, essentially. I'm gonna wipe them out. Psalm 41, 10. But you, O oh Lord, and, and you, know, you might be aware of the whole series of imprecatory psalms where crying out vengeance upon the enemies of God. Psalm 41.10, But you, O oh Lord, be gracious to me, raise me up, that I may repay them, that is, the enemies. By this I know that you are pleased with me because my enemy does not shout and triumph over me. I can hate my enemy. It seems that they were saying. And then Psalm 139, maybe even more clearly, verse 21, Do I not hate those who hate you, O oh Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with the utmost hatred. They have become my enemies. So it would seem that the Pharisees are drawing strongly from that stream to say, yeah, you love your neighbors, who is this very small group of people, ethnic Jews, who are in agreement with our teaching, and you can hate everyone else because God hates them too. 
You might be sitting here going, ooh, maybe the Pharisees were right. No, they weren't. Jesus says, but I say to you, they were not right. Why not? That's a little bit more complex. Right? What, what does it mean that God hates sin and sinners? Well, we're just going to get that started this morning. It'll, we'll, we'll flush it out a little bit more next week. But this kind of as an overview, right, there must be a distinction made between God's judicial dealings with sinful men, his hatred of evil, and his love for those whom he has created. Even as God judges, hear me carefully, he never personally despises or vindictively hates those even upon whom he is placing his judgment. His hate is righteous and judicial. He does not look at sinners and go, I despise you. As in, I am the great God and you are nothing from the standpoint of, of dishonoring them as it were. They are his creatures. He cares for them and he requires the same of us. We may never look at even the most vile sinner and say, you are somehow less than me. I hate you. You are, you are on a lower level than I. I'm going to dishonor you. It's never the hatred of God. His hatred is of sin. And yes, of those who commit it from the standpoint of those who have broken his holy law, not in a despising of them and somehow viewing them as worthless. Again, all creatures and all people in comparison with God are nothing. He says that. But all creatures and all people are in one boat when it comes to God's love of them and his care of them in a general sense. And the general sense I'm speaking of is this, Psalm 145, verse 15. The, Lord, the eyes of the Lord, excuse me, the eyes of all look to you. Now that includes even the creation. E- even the animals and the birds and the sparrows, you know, it, all of that. The eyes of all look to you and you give them food in due time. You open your hand and you satisfy the desire of every living thing. God does not despise his creation even his fallen creation and his fallen creatures. Now, when we begin to think of it in that light, I would have to say that it's not only the Pharisees who struggle with that. Certainly this has been the, the, the nature of man down throughout, to hate and despise others who are not the same as himself. Other races, uh, uh, all, all diff- every different kind of variety of people, there's hatred and despising of them because that's what lies within the sinful heart of man and unfortunately lies even within believers because of the flesh that remains. So I think we are preaching to ourselves or Jesus is preaching to us when he then brings the corrective. Going, oh no, I know who my neighbor is. I understand that I am supposed to broaden that out. That certainly isn't only ethnic Jews and now it's extended to the Gentiles and yes, I'm supposed to love everyone. Y- yes, that's true. But how about that love that you're supposed to be showing towards that homosexual activist that you hate? Or that abortionist whom you despise? Now, I'm not saying, and we'll flesh this out, that you can't hate what's going on, that you can't recognize that as evil and sinful, but despising someone in our heart, a hatred of them, is absolutely unallowable in Scripture at any time for any person. We have to be very careful with that because our hatred of sin so easily tips over into a true despising of others. Now, what is Jesus' teaching on this law of love? He says, but I say to you again. He's going to say, look, this is what you are being taught. This is the, the nature of the perversion, but I'm now going to bring the corrective. Now here's Jesus' teaching on what this is supposed to be, how you are supposed to flesh this out, and he doesn't beat around the bush. He dives instantly for the heart of the matter, and that's the extent of love because the Pharisees, again, had excused themselves. We can love a little because there's only a few people we actually have to love. God hates everybody else too, so so can we. They were wrong on that count, and they were wrong on the expression of love that's supposed to be lavish, poured out upon others, not withheld, and poured out all the way down to whom? Jesus simply, he, he jumps right into the true issue, love your enemies. They were saying, love your neighbor, your friends, essentially. Those that are, uh, that w- they would say God loves, the only ones that God loves, you can love those. And we define that, but Jesus says, no, you love your enemies. They said, hate your enemy. Jesus flips it around instantly and says, love your enemy. That's the command. Not to hate, but to love. And to love those who hate you. To love those who desire your harm. To love those who are directly sinning against you in a hostile way. The exact opposite of what the Pharisees were teaching. Now before we go on here, we need to get a definition of love. And as I mentioned, there's going to be various nuances in the way that Jesus uses it or how we're going to apply it to the people he says are loving. 
But at, it, at its core, fundamentally, a biblical view of love, the love of God shed abroad in our hearts, the love that we are to shed to others is this. It is the Holy Spirit-empowered delight to do everything commanded in God's word, to help another be conformed to the image of Christ regardless of the cost, the perceived worthiness of the person, or what we might receive in return. The Holy Spirit-empowered delight. It is something that the Spirit of God produces. First John is clear that no one who does not know God loves. As we will see, there are echoes of love. Jesus says, look, the tax collectors do a certain amount. The, the Gentiles you know, echo this love in a certain way, but you are supposed to live it truly. You are, you are the only ones capable of actually doing that. It is Holy Spirit empowered, and it's a delight. You see, we'll not do some kind of remove any sort of affectional nature from love, and particularly in this passage. Because saying, there's no way you could have affection towards or, or you could have any kind, of, uh, any kind of feelings for someone who was harming you or who was, who was in abject sin. Yes, you can. There is a kind of affection that can and must be demonstrated towards even the most vile of sinners. And why do I know that? Because Jesus had it. It was not just this rational, I will love you and I can't stand you. And we had affection even for the, the, the vilest of sinners and even at some levels for those who do not respond to him. There is an affection. It's a Holy Spirit empowered delight to do everything commanded in God's word. That is, love is bounded by scripture. That is so important. It is not bounded by your feelings. It is not bounded by culture. It is not bounded by what other people want back from you. It is bounded by scripture alone. The Holy Spirit empowered delight to do everything commanded in God's word to help another be conformed to the image of Christ. Some put in there that it is to do another's highest good. That's true but there is only one highest good in the universe. And that is that we, as individuals, would reflect the nature of Christ. It's the highest good for any person, any time, anywhere, any culture. Food is helpful and good if someone is dying. Medicine is, is good and necessary for the sick. Conformity to Christ, that is coming to a true knowledge of Christ in the gospel through repentance and faith and then ongoing sanctification is the highest need, the greatest good because it brings God the greatest glory. And that's what true love is. We're gonna see it in just a minute. We'll flush it out even more when we consider communion. The Holy Spirit empowered delight to do everything commanded in God's word to help another be conformed to the image of Christ regardless of the cost. And in fact, in spite of the cost would probably be a better way to put that because love will always cost. Regardless of the cost, regardless of the perceived worthiness of the person, it is in that way that love is unconditional. Not that it does not desire other things or response, it does. It's unconditional and that the worthiness of the one being loved is never taken into consideration, not a single time. It is poured out regardless and really, again, in spite of the unworthiness of the object. And then regardless of what might be received in return. Love does not consider a reward. Love receives one, by the way, but it is not enacted to get something in return. That's the love that Jesus is talking about when he says, love your enemy. Empowered by the Spirit of God, affectional according to the affections of God himself, bounded by scripture, unconditional in its application, regardless of cost or sacrifice and all for the purpose of seeing someone in right relationship with God and thus conform to the image of Christ. So when he says, but I say to you, love your enemies, the depth of this is unfathomable. It goes far beyond anything that a tax collector or a Gentile, that is as representatives of unbelievers, of those who have not been changed by the spirit of God, it goes far beyond what any non-kingdom citizen could ever do. Now, as always, I'd like to spend a moment, and there's, again, no place on your outline for this. You'll just have to maybe write it on the back, or I'm only going to get about, this is about as far as I'm going to get through the outline. I'll get, like, maybe one more point. But, so you can write it in maybe on the bottom of your outline. This is what it doesn't mean. To love your neighbor does not mean that you don't confront them in sin. Excuse me, to love your enemy does not mean that you don't confront them in sin. Who were Jesus' greatest enemies? The Pharisees. The very religious leaders that he is really taking to task here. Did ever one time, did, did Jesus ever despise the Pharisees in his heart? Never. 
He never looked down upon them, dishonoring them and, and, and viewing them as chattel or worthless. Never, not a single time, because Jesus loved them. Because he loved his enemies. But that didn't mean he didn't confront them in sin. Matthew 23, 27. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but inside they are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanliness. That's love in action. You see, the world doesn't like that kind of love. Love me, but just don't mess with my sin. Take me just right where I am and don't tell me anything about it. Fine to take someone where they are and then expose to them their need. Well, the love of the world doesn't want that, and unfortunately so often the love of the church doesn't want that either. So to love your enemy doesn't mean you ignore your enemy's sin, because clearly if they're your enemy, the implication here is that they are sinning against you. That's the implication. It's a true enemy, not a perceived enemy, a real one. R.T. France says, a realistic assessment of what loving enemies might mean in practice must of course take account of the very robust way, I love that, robust way in which Jesus enacted or reacted the opposition of the scribes and Pharisees. Yeah, robust, I'll say it was. His concept of love is apparently not at the level of simply being nice to people and of allowing error to go unchallenged. Love is not incompatible with controversy and rebuke. In fact, it often brings it. So understand that that's not what it means. It doesn't mean that you can't, to love your enemy doesn't mean you can't bring up your enemy's sin or even chastise your enemy for it. It doesn't mean that you don't bring to bear consequences for an enemy's actions. And again, this is largely in the, in the more judicial sense or the broader sense. And you might remember the church discipline situation in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Where there's a man who is essentially sleeping with his, most likely his mother-in-law. And the church was apparently, again, saying something along the lines that we're supposed to love. And, and they were rejoicing in their love of uh, an acceptance of this person. Paul says, I've decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? We're still a loving congregation here. Well, you know, Jesus said, love your enemies. So even if they're doing wrong things, you just let them do what they want. No. Love in this case is to confront the individual and, and to put him outside the church. So ultimately, he suffers the ravages of Satan through culture and through consequence so that he will return back to the church. So loving your enemy doesn't mean that you wouldn't bring consequences to bear if that's appropriate and where it is. Loving your enemy doesn't mean that you let them bring harm to your family or innocent people without, without thinking about it. We've already talked about self-defense and other things that the scripture allows. Loving your enemy doesn't mean you invite them to be your best friend. Because this is sometimes what is asked of you. You have someone who is perhaps maybe perverting the law of God, walking away from the Lord. You start to, you know, you start to bring some, some confrontation to them. They go, wait a minute, I thought you loved me. And you start to say things like, hey, I can't have you be my best friend. There's just no way. We can't share the kind of intimacy we share. But I thought the scripture says love. No, love your enemies does not mean that you must invite them to be your best friend. 2 Corinthians 6.14. Do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? What fellowship is light with darkness? What harmony has Christ with Belial? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? You can still love them. You can care for them. You can pour out grace towards them. But it does not mean that they must somehow remain your intimate acquaintance. In fact, that wouldn't be loving at all because you would be pretending that Christ makes no difference. He does. He does. This also does not mean that you have to affirm or love their sin. <clears throat> that you have to overlook it. That you have to pretend that it's really good. No, it isn't that at all. Proverbs 8.13 says, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogance in the evil way, and the perverted mouth I hate. Those who fear the Lord love the Lord, and they hate evil. John MacArthur says it this way, we may sense their wickedness, that is of our enemy, their unfairness, their ungodliness, and their hatred for us. And in light of these things, we could not possibly love them for what they are. We must love them because of who they are. Sinners fallen from the image of God and in desperate need of God's forgiveness and grace, just as we were. There, but for the grace of God go you in every sinner that you see. And the vilest of offenders is you, apart from the grace of God. So there is no one that we cannot love. And really, that's the, if we want to flesh out then what does it mean, in the bigger picture it means this, no one is ever excluded from being loved regardless of the vileness of their offense or how harmful it is to you. No one. So again, what this does not mean doesn't hold a candle essentially to what it does mean. 
And when someone is harming you, dishonoring you, treating you in a worthless fashion, that you are to pour back out towards them a delightful service which does everything that Scripture commands to see them walking in a manner that would please the Lord. Love's question is never who to love because we are to love everyone, but only how to love most biblically. We are not to love only in terms of feeling, but also in terms of service. God's love embraces the entire world. He loved each of us even while we were still sinners and while we were his enemies. And so in the big picture, love means to love everyone. And Jesus goes to the very bottom level when he says enemies. And additionally, it always means looking for a way to bring the gospel to bear. Always. Love cannot be love unless Christ is exalted through the proclamation of the gospel. That's essential to love. 1 John 4, 9. By this, the love of God was manifested in us. That God has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love God one another. The fundamental, the, the, the most basic issue in love is that the gospel of Jesus Christ is lifted high because that is the most loving thing that you could ever do. And certainly it is what an enemy needs. Now, I said going loving your enemies is Jesus goes right to the bottom level. Well, not exactly because there is someone, essentially there are various kinds of enemies, aren't there? There are enemies who just dislike you a little bit. There are enemies who maybe told some, you know, who gossiped about you some. There, there are various kinds of enemies. And so Jesus now is going to go even further. So look back at your text, verse 44. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That would be the active enemy the enemy who comes against you to bring you harm. And this word is most often used in regard to your faith. The fact that you are a member of the kingdom, that is why you are coming under attack. And consider it, the, the way that you are seeking to be most loving, you are bringing to them the best news. You are providing for them the very way in which they could be saved from eternal hell and they turn it around and begin to persecute you and attack you and harm you. And in the greatness of that reversal, it is so easy to get angry and to be bitter that in, in trying to do the very best for them, they would turn it on you and do the worst to you. And that's why Jesus says, you pray for your persecutors. It is the application also that he brings that we are to pray. And, and you might be thinking, well, I mean, that seems a little weak, right? Just prayer? I mean, all I have to do is pray for my persecutors? I want you to consider it this way. I, I think what is, what is in mind or what is in view here because certainly Jesus speaks of a robust response to enemies in providing them food and drink and, and ministering to their needs. I think the picture that we have here is you have been persecuted to the point where literally you can do nothing else. When the nails are being driven into your hands or the spear being driven into your heart or, or the insults being, being hurled at you with no other recourse, there's no other way to serve or minister to this enemy than, than what represents your true love for him is when there no, was nothing else to do, you pour out your heart in prayer for them. And when you get to that point and you can pray for your enemies, then you are demonstrating the reality of what Jesus is commanding here. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Persecutors are the most difficult enemies to love. And certainly we understand, and I'm sure what has leapt to your mind is the very example of Jesus himself. Certainly he served his enemies. Certainly he gave to them. Certainly he healed them. Certainly he gave them food. He provided for them. But when he could do nothing else, as it were, he was in fact providing everything for them when he died on the cross. But as he dies there, as they nail his hands to the cross and his feet to the cross. What does he do with, with nothing else as it were to do? The heart of the love of Jesus for his enemies is expressed in Luke 23, 34. But Jesus was saying, and it's very interesting, it would appear that the saying there's in the imperfect tense, on and on and on. This wasn't a one-time message. He was saying, he was praying. Very possibly he begins praying when he goes, as, as he's nailed to the cross, prays all the way through, Sometimes, perhaps, it being 
audible, for, but Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, forgive them, forgive them, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots, dividing up his garment among themselves as he prays for their forgiveness. The Roman soldiers at the cross cast dice for, to, to rip up his, the, the phony robe that they gave him, mocking him as king. As the scribes and Pharisees walk by, hurling insults, and certainly this forgive them extends to those beyond the base of the cross, out into the crowd, and literally out into, into Israel as a whole. Those who had hours before said, crucify him, and we will take responsibility. We and our children will take responsibility for his blood. Jesus is saying, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. They're calling him, the scribes and Pharisees, mocking him, saying, if you are the Savior, save yourself, you moron, you fool. And Jesus is saying, forgive them. Did that mean that all of them were saved, that the instant we received that forgiveness? It does not. It does mean, it is the heart of Jesus, that they would repent and believe, even as they killed him. But it may yet be that you consider that example and Although we know that Jesus was a man acting in the power of the Spirit, even as he was fully and completely God, the God-man, it may be that you're like, well, I mean, that's Jesus. People don't do that. Oh, but there's another illustration coming to mind, isn't it? I see it on your face. It's Stephen. He was a man, not God, but a man what? Filled with the Spirit of God. And in Acts chapter 7, I want you to turn there as, as we start moving towards communion. In Acts chapter 7, we have really at verse chapter six and seven, we have the response of Stephen to accusations that he was a blasphemer, that he blasphemed Moses, blasphemed the temple, blasphemed God, blasphemed the law, blasphemed the Messiah or the true deliverer. And so he responds to all of those accusations and it begins, I don't have time to flush it out for you, it begins when in, in chapter six we find out that he's a man full of the spirit. He's brought, he's dragged before the, the, the Sanhedrin with false witnesses he begins his defense in chapter 7, and I've just been listening to a, an excellent series by, by John MacArthur on the defense of Stephen. And guys, if, if you don't take time to listen to sermons, you ought to. Go to Grace to You, start downloading some of these things, get one, get that particular series, just masterful. And it's not because it's John MacArthur, he's preaching the word. So find people that will preach the word, it's just been resonating in my mind, and, and by the words, grace fit beautifully with what we were talking about this morning, which is the way it often works, by the way, that's why you listen to sermons. So he makes his whole defense, and as he reaches the end of that defense, in Acts chapter 7, verse 53, excuse me, verse 54, they heard this, they were cut to the quick, and they began gnashing their teeth at him. Actually, let's jump back up to verse 51. You men who are stiff-necked. Now, he finishes his defense, saying, look, I love Moses. Moses was great. I love the law that Moses, that God gave Moses to write. I love the temple. I love the prophets of God. I love the Messiah. You're the one that hates all of those. You are the ones that have, that have blasphemed. You are the ones that have rejected Moses and the law and the Messiah and the temple and God. You've rejected them all. I haven't. You men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised and heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. You are doing just as your fathers did. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? They killed those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. And I tell you that Stephen said all of this with a heart of love for those Pharisees and scribes. How do I know that? We'll see it in just a minute. This was not said out of rancor. It was not said out of anger. It was not said out of self-righteousness and arrogance. It was said out of greatest love for them so that they would understand who they truly are. And that's how the gospel is presented. But it was strong. It was powerful. It was Holy Spirit inspired. And again, it says from the very beginning, Stephen was filled with the Holy Spirit. Verse 53, you receive the laws ordained by angels, yet you do not keep it. Verse 54, when they heard this, they were cut to the quick, I'll bet. They began gnashing their teeth at him, but being full of the Holy Spirit. And please understand that that was not some one-time filling, some special empowerment so that he could come. No, he started full of the Spirit, he ends full of the Spirit, he preaches in the Spirit, and that's the same thing that every one of us is called to be, constantly filled with the Spirit. This is possible for every believer because you have the fullness of the Spirit indwelling you, and Galatians, or Ephesians 5 says you are to be continually filled with the Spirit. Stephen was, and this is what happens. So as they rush to kill him, he, he remains full of the Holy Spirit. He gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God, and he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened, 
and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. They cried with a loud voice, covered their ears, rushed at him with one impulse. They were driven insane in their anger. When they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him. The witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. They went on stoning Stephen. So they rush at him, they push him over a cliff, they begin to throw rocks at him after taking a moment to lay aside their robes because they can't, the robes will catch as they try to throw the rocks so they need to get them, get them off. They're stoning Stephen and this is what he says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He says that first, but then the last words on his lips are this. And falling on his knees, and the contrast is just so powerful of those filled with hate, his enemies to the extreme because of the preaching and teaching of the word of God and Stephen who, who is filled with the spirit whose face we find in in the other part of this passage like an angel that is calm, serene, able to respond to them, loving them. And we know, see, we know he loved them by this. His last words as the rocks crush the life out of him are these, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Which is why I believe Jesus says, pray for your persecutors. Stephen had no, there's nothing else to do. There's no way to serve them. No, he, he had done, he'd done everything. And the last thing that he could do is he, the life is crushed out of him by his persecutors. The last act of love that he could possibly commit is prayer, and he does it. It's a man filled with the Spirit of God. True Christian martyrs do not die with curses on their lips, but with blessings and prayers. Read your history. It began with Jesus moves out into Stephen, the first martyr that we see directly, the first one we hear from, and then moves out into church history. Read your Fox's book of martyrs. William Tyndale didn't go to the stake cursing his persecutors, screaming at them for the injustice done to him. Instead, he cries out, God, open the eyes of the king of England, the very one who had stuck him on the stake and was burning him to death, essentially. They're the love of God is poured out through William Tyndale and martyr after martyr after martyr. I ask you, can we do less? And you might not be being placed upon the stake now, but remember, Jesus is making an argument from the greater to the lesser. If you can pray for your persecutors when they're killing you, can we not pray for those who are maybe gossiping about us or sinning in some way towards us, as harmful as it may be? Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. And next week we will talk about the fact that you do that because that's what God does. And we've already seen that in Jesus. But now as we move to communion, if the men will come forward to begin to prepare, I just want to bring you back to where I started, which is John 3.16. As we consider the nature of what is here and the challenge that we have before us in contemplating and responding to the sacrifice of Christ, let's just consider the love of God displayed on the cross. And you might have wondered about my definition of love. Where did you get that? Well, I got it from John 3.16. It says this, for God so loved. God is love. He was driven and motivated by love. Everything he does is done in love. There's nothing that he does that is outside of his love, his wrath, his jealousy, his holiness, all that's bound up. He's a loving God who pursues everything he does in love. God desired that the people of the world be restored to right relationship with himself. This is for their greatest good and it is for his greatest glory. For God so loved the world that he gave. The essence of love is to sacrifice. This is what God eternally does. From before the beginning of time, it was determined that God would sacrifice in this way. He is eternally giving, eternally generating, eternally loving, sacrificing For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. When God gives, he gives the very best. He gives that which will meet the need. It is always sufficient, and in this case, infinitely sufficient to meet the need. His unique, one and only beloved son. Not a lesser being, not a created being to send down and and, and just get in the way so that he might pour wrath upon that, that, that straw man. No, pouring his own wrath upon his own son whom he loved infinitely. This is love. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that, or that, whosoever believes in him might not perish. Here's the motive of a love driven by mercy that desires to save man from the certain judgment he deserves, that of punishment in hell forever. This is what love 
always does. It longs to give mercy. To withhold from the one who deserves full punishment that punishment. To provide the way in which that withholding might be justly done. This is what love longs for. Do you long for mercy for those who are currently harming our culture, harming our people, and maybe harming you? Do you long that they would receive mercy? God does. That whoever believes in him might not perish, but have eternal life. Here is the additional aspect of love exemplified in grace in which God desires to provide for the sinner that which he does not deserve, eternal, abundant, joyful life in perfect relationship to Father, Son, and Spirit. Is that what you long for for your enemies? That above all things you would desire for mercy to be shown them that they would not receive the punishment that they deserve and for grace to be given to them that they would receive that which they could never deserve, which is eternal life in perfect relationship with God. It is what he has given you. Can we not, would we not, must we not long for that for others? We must. It is the heart of the gospel and is the heart of what we celebrate here. Because we were that enemy. And we were the one who despised and dishonored God in every way. So, really two aspects of of what I hope you will do as we pass the elements. First, would be that you would grieve. That you would grieve over a lack of love in your own heart. As I grieve over mine. As I've grieved over it this week, as I look at my life and see that I do not live this fully, but it is my longing, and I grieve over the places that I don't do it, and I pray that you would, and I pray that you would repent. But I ask also that you would rejoice at the love of God demonstrated for you that covers your lack of love, that overcomes for you the love that you cannot give, and has provided that love in your place. So there's both a grieving and repenting and a rejoicing that will come from our celebration of communion. And might the Lord grant you grace to pursue that as we pass the elements.